Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios in rain-drenched Bolivar, West Virginia. I'm Phil Bernberg, and today's topic is making test blends for glazes and clay bodies. And I want to mention up front that we have a number of handouts that we'd like to be able to provide for you. There's a link, there will be a link in the description of the video that you, where you can go to the link and you can download these handouts. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Okay, so today's topic is making test blends for glazes and clay bodies, or the subtopic is what the heck is a quadraxial blend? And the point is that the whole point of this talk is the fact that when you're, when you're changing glaze recipes or when you're changing clay bodies or even if you're developing completely new glazes or clay bodies, you need some kind of a system or a method for keeping track of your samples and, and you know, organizing your samples to cover all, you know, all the different combinations of the materials that you're working with. And so what we're going to be talking about are different methods or approaches for sort of keeping to record keeping or diagramming your, your tests. And so the first thing, if we start off is with, if we start off with two ingredients, there are two ways to approach um, two ingredients, and they're called line blends. And they're really, they're called line blends because you can diagram, we're gonna be talking about a lot of sort of diagrams today, but you can diagram them as a line. And so the first, the first kind is called an additive line blend. And basically what it means is, I'm going to take a certain composition, a certain material, let's say this is 100% of A, whatever that ingredient is, and I'm going to add a small amount of something else, in this case B, to it. And then I'm going to take a sample right there. I'm going to, let's say if this is a glaze, I'd add the second material to it, stir it up, and dip a little sample in. Then I'm going to add another, put another addition in, and I'm going to mix it up and dip another sample, and I'm going to keep on doing that. Every time I make an addition, another addition, I take another sample. So I'm not making up separate batches for each composition. I'm changing the composition of the batch as I go along and taking samples as I go along. So I really just have one batch that I'm constantly changing, okay? And if I look at sort of how the numbers work out, this is this sort of, I happen to do six compositions here. So I've got, when I start, I have 100% of the first material and none of the second, and I dip a sample in and I take a sample. And then I add, let's say, five grams of, the, of B, and I dip a sample in, and then I add another five grams of B, dip a sample in. And the point of these numbers is the fact that even though it looks like I'm adding nice round numbers like five, the actual percentages don't work out to be the same. So that by the time I've added 10 grams of the second material, the actual percentage is around 9.1, if you, if you actually, you know, if, if you, when you calculate it out, because now I've got 10 grams of B out of a total of 110 grams, which is 9.1%. So this is, only gonna, this is not going to give you nice round percentages. And also, there's another factor here is that, of course, every time I dip a sample in, I'm removing a little bit of the whole batch. So the, whole, the total weight of the batch is also changing. So it's not, it's not going to give me extremely precise percentages. But it's a great way with a very simple method. It's, it's, this is also sometimes called the electric blender method because I can do it, I literally put it in a blender and every time I make an addition, I, I mix it up in the blender and then dip another sample. So this is some, as I said, sometimes called the blender method. But it's nice because I only need to make one batch and I can keep adding amounts of the second material and get a lot of samples out of it out of just one batch. And if I find when I do this and I do the testing, that there's one particular range of compositions that I really like for whatever property I'm looking for, whether it's color or firing temperature or whatever, then I can go back and do more detailed testing to sort of narrow it down and really nail down the percentages precisely, okay? And the way I could do that would be in, this, in the second method would be what's called the crossover line blend. So in the first, and again, I can represent it with a line diagram. The first one is sort of an open-ended line where I just keep adding materials to it. In the second one, I can think of it as sort of as a closed line where I've got 100% I've got A at one end and 100% B at the other. And so anything in between I can represent by you know, a mark, for instance. So like right in the middle would be 50-50. 
or 2575 or 7525, and I can make any number of divisions that I want to along this line. But the point is here is that each one of these represents a separate batch or a separate mixture that I make up. I'm not changing the composition the way I was the first time. So here's, here's an example of a crossover line blend for 11 compositions, and it's 11 because we've included the end. So I've got the first one is 100% A, and all the way at the other end, I've got 100% B, and then I've got, so I go, for instance, from 100% A to 90% A with 10% B, 20% B, 30% B, and it's crossover because the point is that as one increases, the other decreases, and the percentage is always 100% as I go along. I've, I never have more than, I've always, I'm, I'm decreasing the amount of A, and I'm increasing the amount of B as I go along this line, like that, okay? So in this case, I can, in this case, I could make up 10 batches and get pretty good coverage of all the possible combinations of A and B, and I can look at the, how the property that I'm interested in is changing over that range of compositions, okay? So that's for two components. And again, these, are all going to be, these will all be available with these percentages as handouts. So now if I go to three, if I go to the next, next slide here and I go to three ingredients, then I go to what's called the triaxial diagram. And by drawing a triangle instead of a line, now I can show all possible combinations of three ingredients. So if I set it up as a triangle, the same way the ends of my line were 100%, now the corners are 100%. So this corner is 100% A, this is 100% B, and this is 100% C. And I can make any number of gradations that I want to. I could have just, you know, 50, 50 along the outside, or any number of units, depending on how, how, many, how many separate points or, or samples I want to make up. So for example, one of the, and one of, the common, one of the confusing things about this kind of a diagram is, how do, you, how do you actually calculate, or how do you mark what the percentages are? How do you count? Well, what you do is if, if, if this is 100% A, then the opposite side is 0A. So if I, count all, if I count along the lines that go, that go across the diagram, if this is 0A, this is then this, is, this line is 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% A. And the same way with B. If this is B, 100%, then anywhere along this line is 0B. So I can go 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100% B, and so forth for C. So if I want to, if I want to look at these, these different points that I've rep represented, each point represents a combination of the three ingredients. So if I, let's say if I look at five, I can say, well, okay, if I just look at the diagram, what is the composition of five? Okay, well, I'll start with A and I'll go with zero, 20, 40, it's 60% A, and I'll start over here, this is zero, so this is 20% B, and I'll start over here and count towards C. This is 0, 20% C. And if I look at 5, it's 60% A, 20% B, 20% C. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. And what I can also do with, now this case, we're showing the same way on, my, on my, uh, my line diagrams here, I was showing the individual composition as sort of marks or points along the line, and we're showing the compositions in this triaxial diagram as points on, on a triangle, but I can, also, I can also represent them as circles. So I can, set up some, I can set up this diagram to look something like this. And so forth. And then the nice thing about this is then I can actually write the composition in these, each one of these circles. And if I make these, if, if I, when I make, actually make up my test samples, I can actually te set the test samples on this diagram. And so I've created almost a composition map. And I can look at this, this composition and look and see how the samples are changing. And, and I can just, you know, make decisions as to what's the best area on this diagram, what's the best composition for whatever property I'm looking for. 
Okay? And this, I found that, um, well, actually, let me, let's go to the next slide. Because what we've done is we've included two slides here that show you the, the percentages. And again, this, this is why, one of the reasons why we wanted to provide these in the handouts. This is a reasonable size, a reasonable size of test. So here's, here's a traxial blend set up for 15 compositions. That's, so you'd make up 15 different samples, let's say, to do this. And then we have a second one that shows the compositions for 21 compositions. So it's a little, a little more, a little smaller divisions in percentages. But again, it's not an unreasonable number. And if you did a test like this, you could, you could basically get a nice feel for how the properties are changing for all the different comp the combinations of those ingredients. So again, these are going to be available in the handouts. So one of, the, one of the things that I found from a practical point of view was that I found a triaxial diagram, for, as, for example, to be very, very useful when we were making up clay, new clay bodies. Um, one of the when I was teaching a class um, on, on making up clay bodies, we used the triaxial diagrams as part of our approach. So one of the things we did was we'd make up a triaxial diagram first for the clay. A clay body typically does not just contain one kind of clay. It usually contains a blend of several different kinds of clays plus a flux and plus usually a glass form, such as quartz. So we'd, make, we'd start off by evaluating a mixture of clays, let's say EPK and ball clay, and then let's say a stoneware clay. And we'd make up maybe 10, the way we used to do it typically was 10. So we'd make up, let's say, 10 combinations Of, all, of combinations of these, of these clay bodies, and we'd find the best mixture of, this is just pure clay, with respect to like, what was the plasticity of them? How, were they sticky? Were they not sticky? Um, how, how, did they shrink a lot when they dried? Um, were they plastic enough to work with? And then what we do is, we, so we'd pick a particular composition, let's say it might be this one, and we'd say, okay, now I'm gonna make up a second triaxial blend, and I'm gonna take this composition that I liked and make that the corner of my new blend. So this is now my clay blend. And then plus I'd have a flux, which let's say that's feldspar, would be a common flux for a clay body. And then this would be quartz. And so now I'd repeat the same thing. I'd make up all these samples and it could be more than 10. This is just, 10 was a reasonable number to sort of start and sort of cover the whole area and see where the, the best compositions might lie. So we'd repeat that, and then this way we'd come up with our final composition for our clay body using the blend of clays and the flux and the, and the quartz. And so this was a very useful approach, and it, it didn't involve an unreasonable number of samples. Okay. So, let's, so let's, let's move on now and talk about the, the dreaded quadraxial blend. And a, basically, a, a quadraxial blend now is a way to consider um, four, four separate ingredients. And again, since it, in this case, it's drawn, it looks like a square. And we have an example here on the slide. And so again, now the each one of the, the same way in the triangle diagram, each one of the corners represents 100% of something. And we're showing this diagram not as points, but as boxes. It could be circles or boxes, but rather, so each one of these boxes represents a point on one of, those, one of the other diagrams. So this corner, this box is 100% A, this is 100% B, 100% C, and 100% D. And the same way as on the triaxial diagram with the outside lines, because they connected only two points were line blends, that's, that's true here also. So each outside row, from, for instance, from here to here, is a line blend, a crossover line blend between A and B. This one is 100% A, this is 100% B, so this is 25% B, 50% B, 75% C, and 100% B. And the same, so each outside line is a line blend. So then within the diagram, these samples right here, those represent possible combinations of all three, okay? Now one other, one, the, an important point to make about a, a, a quadraxial blend is it doesn't show 
every possible combination of those four ingredients. You can't do that on a two-dimensional diagram like this. What you'd actually have to have is you'd actually have to have a three-dimensional diagram that looked like a pyramid. So you'd actually have to have something, it would be a three-dimensional solid pyramid, and you could represent this on a computer. So if this was A, and this was B, and this was C, that would be a triaxial diagram, and now I'd come up from that, come out in space to D. So if I, had, if I wanted to represent truly all possible combinations, I'd have a triaxial diagram, and I'd show A, B, and C, and then I'd come up in space inside the, the pyramid to show, to add the D. So I can't show every possible one, but this is still a very useful approach for covering a fair number of compositions, you know, if I, f of, of, of the four ingredients. It's still a, it's still a useful way of showing it. Um, one of the things, on, to give you an example of, we did set up We've done, and again, when I was teaching a class on this, we, we, as an exercise, we used to make up a quadraxial blend for glazes. We found that quadraxial blends were very useful to do glaze testing to look at a combination of ingredients and say, if I looked at different combinations of these four ingredients, what would be the best composition that could give me a working glaze? So for example, I could make up, I could set up a quadraxial blend that would have materials like Dolomite, for example, dolomite and quartz and ball clay or just clay and a feldspar as a flux. Okay, so in this case I have two fluxes. I have dolomite and I have feldspar and I have clay and I have quartz. So I have all the ingredients I need to make up a glaze. I have my, my fluxes, my stabilizer, and my glass former. And we did this and we're going to, we'll talk about that. Okay, so here is, here is an example of a quadraxial blend that was done by one of my graduate students in terms of exploring what combinations of these four ingredients could yield a glaze. So we had dolomite was one of the ingredients, um, quartz, ball clay, and G200 feldspar. So I have my two fluxes, my dolomite and my feldspar, and I have clay and I have quartz, so I have all the, I have all the, the three categories of materials that I need in a Seeger formula, for example. And so this, these, were, these were small batches that were made up and they were fired to cone 10. And if you look at the results, you can see that the dolomite, it may be hard to see, but the dolomite and the quartz and the ball clay didn't melt at all. And you wouldn't expect them to. Whereas the G200 feldspar, that's a potash feldspar, melted, basically melted completely. It was a thick melt, but it melted completely. But what we were really most, in, and, and again, the way I explained before is, so each one of the outsides is a line blend. So on this side between quartz and dolomite, nothing basically happened. They didn't react, and so nothing melted along that outside. And the same way, the same way here, I got a little bit of melting down here, because now in this case, the dolomite reacted with the ball clay, and I got a little bit of softening and melting here. And the same way down this side with the quartz and the feldspar, when I got close to the feldspar, starting about here, I started getting a little bit of melting. But I was really interested in the areas where, um, where I had all four ingredients. And so I could, I, the nice thing is I can look at these, this sort of as a map, and I can look on here and see where do I get things that look like glazes. Well, here's a good example. Here's box number 14, which is 12.5% A, uh, looks like 37.5% B, 12% C, and 37.5% D. And this looks like a pretty nice glaze right here. And as a matter of fact, what's interesting is this. This composition here corresponds pretty closely to the, the classic 4-3-2-1 glaze of Bernard Leach, which is 40% feldspar, 30% silica, 20% whiting, and 10% EPK. And whiting, as we know, you know, whiting is calcium carbonate, and dolomite is calcium magnesium carbonate, so they're pretty similar. So the nice thing is that this kind of cor cor corroborates also the fact that that's basically the composition of Leach's 4321. So it's an, this is a great way of looking at, a, at these compositions and saying, where do I get something that looks like a glaze, or that, that's going to work like a glaze? Okay, so one, one final point we wanted to make about the quadraxial blend is, again, here we've only shown, you know, basically divisions of 25% increments. And you're not limited to that. Just as with any of these diagrams, you can make a whole lot, a lot more divisions. So, for example, if we go to the next chart, here's a quadraxial blend set up 
where we're going in 10% increments instead of 25. So we end up with 121 different compositions. So we still have the corner. This is still 100% A, 100% B, 100% C, 100% D. But now we're going in, in increments along the outside of 10% rather than 25%. So we end up with a lot more compositions. And again, the same thing is, this, this is very similar, or actually this is identical, to the crossover line. Very similar, C is, is very similar to identical. Um, this, is, this is the same as the crossover line blend we showed earlier on, where I've got units of 10% going from A to B, and I've got 11 of them. So that's the exact same thing we showed along earlier when we talked about the crossover line blend. One other nice feature, though, of quadraxial blends is, if I were to make a big one like this, and I find a particular area, the same way that I did with the triaxial blend before, where I can sort of zoom in on it, I can take a part, just a part of this. So I could take this square. If I found, let's say I did this, and I found some compositions here that I liked, I could take this part of it right here, for example, and make a new quadraxial blend and sort of blow it up and make smaller divisions to investigate just that area. So I don't have to use the whole 100% at the, uh, of, at the corners, I can take just part of it and use it if I want to zero in on that part of the composition, okay? One final point I did want to make, though, is the fact that there are other kind of composition diagrams out there that are, that, for example, are square, and they're not necessarily um, a quadraxial blend. So um, Ian, Cur Ian Curry, in his book Revealing Glazes, published in, in 2000, talks about what he calls the grid method for, for looking at or examining glazes. And he comes up with a diagram that looks sort of like this. But what he's really plotting here is percent aluminum oxide and percent silica. And so he ends up with sort of a map. So like down here in this region, so this is a graph. As you increase this way, the silica is increasing. As you increase this, the alumina is increasing. So this is a map of different glaze compositions. So up here, in this area, I have low silica but high alumina. And out here, I have low alumina but I have high silica. And up here, I have both of them. I have high alumina and high silica, so I have low flux. If, I have, if both of these are high, then I don't have much left to have the flux. And down here, in this corner, I have low alumina and low silica, so I have high flux. So I end up with a map of different glaze compositions, but I'm really, and, but I'm really only showing two different things. I'm really only showing the amount of alumina and the amount of silica. So it's not a quadraxial blend. I'm not really showing four separate ingredients. I'm really just showing what happens if I just vary the two. And when I'm doing this, I don't change the, the, the composition of the fluxes at all. Whereas in the diagram I just showed, for instance, with the dolomite and the feldspar, those compositions were changing. For this kind of a diagram, I would keep the, 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 the fluxes, the composition of the fluxes the same, and I'm really just varying the amount of the alumina silica. So just a precaution, not everything that looks like a square diagram is necessarily a quadraxial blend. Okay, well, I hope, this, I hope this has been useful information for you today. Um, we know this was a lot of information in a short period of time. If you'd like to hear it again, you can listen to our podcast version on your favorite platform. Go, just look for the Potter's Roundtable. Um, also, if you enjoyed the presentation, please like it uh, and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends. This helps our videos get found on YouTube. Um, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. And we especially really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts, such as these videos. If you'd like to help us out, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. And I guess then, thank you for visiting with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.